the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The year 1892 provided some history-making events, such as the completion of the Cape Johannesburg Railroad, the introduction of the first automatic telephone switchboard, the granting of patent rights for the internal combustion engine. Gladstone was chosen prime minister. And last but not least, a genius by the name of Sherlock Holmes took up residence at 221B Baker Street, offering his services as a consulting detective. And very shortly thereafter, he was called upon to solve the mysterious affair of the barrel coronet. Arthur, what are you doing in my room at this time of night? And why have you taken the coronet from the bureau? Father, I... I... You've dropped it! You've destroyed it, you thief! What did you do with the jewels you stole? Father, if you believe me a thief, I'll leave your house in the morning. If you leave, you'll leave in the hands of the police. The fact that I'm your father will not stop me from prosecuting you to the limit of the law for this vicious crime. Our mystery drama... The Adventure of the Barrel Coronet was adapted from the Conan Doyle classic especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contac, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Star is Born is a theatrical statement of unarguable clarity. However, the truth of the statement doesn't apply only in the theater, but in the fashion, the arts, and literature. And so it was with Sherlock Holmes, who gained instant immortality as the world's foremost detective when he was first created by A. Conan Doyle more than 100 years ago. And now, we pick up Holmes and his famous friend, Dr. Watson, cozy by the fireplace in their Baker Street flat on a winter morning. I was standing at our bow window overlooking Baker Street one February morning when I observed a most unusual sight. A well-dressed man in his fifties running down the street oblivious of the stairs of passers-by with his hands jerking up and down and his head waggling on his body. And I called to my friend, Holmes, uh, look at this madman. Doesn't it appear rather sad that his relatives allow him to come out alone? I think, Watson, I recognize the symptoms. They portray not madness, but a desire to consult me professionally. Mm. Ah, did I not tell you? The door, Watson, before he pulls the bell out of its socket. No doubt you think me mad. Oh, I see that you've had some great trouble. Heaven knows I have. A devilish combination of public disgrace and private affliction. Besides, it's not my trouble alone. The very noblest in the land may suffer unless a way is found out of this frightful affair. Pray you compose yourself, sir, and try to give me a clear account of who you are and this trouble that has befallen you. I'm probably known to you by name. I'm Alexander Holder, senior partner in the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson on Threadneedles. We have indeed heard of you, sir, and your firm. Oh, then you will understand what it means to me to have my son arrested and jailed for theft. Hmm. Who brought these charges against him? I did, Mr. Holmes. My son left me no choice. There's no doubt about his guilt. None at all. Well, then, what brings you to me? Desperation. I confess it. Complete desperation. 
Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard gave me your name. Ah. Although neither of us have much hope there's anything you can do. If that's true, I think you should hear it from me. But I can make no judgment until I have all the facts before me. It would help if you would start from the beginning. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Well, as you must know, one of our largest sources of income comes from confidential, very discreet loans to some of England's noblest families mm -hmm. who leave with us unimpeachable security. Your reputation in that field is well known. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yesterday morning, I advanced the sum of 50,000 pounds to... Well, the name really should remain confidential. As you wish, as you wish. And the security for this large sum? You have heard of the Beryl Coronet? Mm. One of the most precious public possessions of the Empire. And I respect your desire for discretion with the name of the owner, which is well known to the world. Uh, I suppose it was inevitable you'd know the owner's name. I am surprised that this august gentleman would allow the coronet out of his possession. I brought that point up. But he assured me that he needed the money for only four days. And he was certain the coronet would be safe in my hands for that short length of time. And from what I gather, you took it home with you. Wasn't that an unusual procedure? Well, decidedly. But the coronet was so precious, I, I, I felt it would be imprudent to leave it behind me. Mm -hmm. Bankers' safes have been forced before. And if it should happen to me, <laughs> what a disaster. And therefore, I resolved that for the next few days I would carry the case containing the coronet back and forth with me, never leaving it out of my position. And your son, of course, knew about the coronet. Alas, yes. <laughs> Arthur's a good boy, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I must seem like an old fool telling you that while he's sitting in jail. You you see, Mr. Holmes, I've spoiled Arthur. Well, I don't deny it. I've granted his every wish, including allowing him to become a member of an aristocratic club where he fell in with men with long purses and expensive habits. Uh -huh. He gambled and lost and came to me... A, Again and again, imploring me for advances on his allowance to settle his debts. I take it, then, that he's more or less a gentleman of leisure. I wanted him very much to, to succeed me in my business. But to tell the truth, I was afraid to trust him with the handling of large sums of money. In fact, it was the conversation I had with him yesterday evening in my study that is the most damning piece of evidence. I'll try to lay it before you just as it happened. I don't suppose you're going to look upon what I had to say very kindly, but I've left myself no choice. Is it money again, Arthur? I'm afraid so. Can you let me have 200 pounds? No! I cannot! I'm sorry. That's not true. I, I will not. I've been much too generous with you in money matters. I won't deny you've been very kind to me, Father, but, but this is truly an emergency. I must have the money or I can never show my face inside the club again. Well, a very good thing if you don't. You, you mean you'd have me leave the club a dishonored man? Well, that's something of your own doing. I couldn't bear the disgrace. My patience has run out. You won't get a farthing from me. Very well. If you won't let me have it, then I must try whatever other means I can find. Those were his last words before he left the room. Damning, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They can be. I'll withhold judgment until I have more to go on. Now, you've told me your son knew the coronet was in the house. Did he also know where? Uh, I see you're trying to do your best for him, Mr. Holmes, but it's no use. Arthur not only knew it was in the house, but also the exact location. How did that come about? Well, when I told him and my niece Mary about the coronet, they were both desperately anxious to get a close look at the famous crown. I thought it was wiser to leave it undisturbed. Well, then how? Arthur asked me where I'd put it. And when I told him it was in my bureau, he remarked that he hoped the house wouldn't be burgled during the night. I responded that my bureau was locked. And he told me that any old key would fit my bureau. In fact, he went so far as to say he'd open it himself as a child with a key of a, of a box room cupboard. 
A most singular statement. Don't you think, sir? That's not the way I'd characterize it. It seemed to me absolute proof to his guilt. Mm, I still have reached no conclusion on that point, Mr. Holder. You have yet to hear the worst. After he left, I started around the house to see that all was secure. Is that your usual habit? No, no, not at all. I usually leave that to my niece, Mary. But last night, in view of the circumstances, I thought it best that I check myself. Understandable. And? Well, you must understand that my niece had lived with us for the past 15 years, and our relationship is more than that of father and daughter and of uncle and niece. As I came down the stairs, I saw Mary closing and fastening a window in the hall. Upon seeing me, she said immediately... Dad, did you give Lucy the maid permission to go out tonight? No, certainly not. She came in just now by the rear door. I don't doubt that she only went to the side gate to see her young man. But I think it could be dangerous if she makes a habit of it. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. One of us must speak to her in the morning. I'll do it. You have enough on your mind. <laughs> All right. Well, certainly, thank you. Good night, dear. Dad, it, is it the coronet or is there something else bothering you? Oh, dear, dear. How well you know me, dear Mary. Yes, yes, there is something... I you know how I wish you could have found it in your heart to marry Arthur. It's my fondest wish. I know. So I left her. Went up to my bedroom. Checked that the coronet was still where I'd placed it. And went to bed and fell asleep. I'm not a very heavy sleeper. About two in the morning, I was awakened by some sound in the house. I lay listening. Suddenly, to my horror, there was a distinct sound of footsteps moving softly in the next room. Well, I slipped fearfully out of bed and peered around the corner of my dressing room door. I'd left the gas half up, and by its light, I saw my son... Dressed only in his shirt and trousers, standing beside the light, holding the coronet in his hands. He appeared to be wrenching at it with all his strength. I shouted at him, asking what he was doing in my room at this time of night. At my cry, he turned pale as death and dropped the coronet. Oh, Father, no wonder you shake, you blackguard. Where are the jewels you've stolen from the coronet? Stolen? Yes, you thief. There are no jewels missing. There, there can't be any missing. There are three missing. And you know where they are. Must I call you a liar as well as a thief? You've called me names enough. I shall leave your house in the morning. If you don't tell me what you've done with the jewels, you'll leave in the hands of the police. If you choose to call the police, then let them find what they can. Father... I won't raise a finger to help you. Today there's a good deal of talk about the breakdown of communications between parents and children. It certainly seems that there's a lack of communication between Arthur Holder and his father, and with good reason. What is the good reason? We'll find out in Act Two when I return shortly. Every father wants his son to grow up to be somebody. No matter that child experts claim this wish is, in reality, an expression of the father's own frustrations. One of the last things in the world a father would want is for his son to be a thief. So it's not difficult to imagine the staggering shock Alexander Holder underwent when he caught his only son, Arthur, in the act of stealing a priceless jeweled coronet. There's more to that miserable night than I've related, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> but I, I, I can't go on. Oh, what should I do? In one night, I've lost my honor, my gems, and my son. What should I do? Face the facts. 
Pull yourself together and continue with the story. I'm not convinced that your son is a thief. But I saw him with a coronet in his hand. I hardly consider that conclusive. Was the remainder of the coronet at all injured? Yes, it was twisted. Mm -hmm. Isn't it possible that he was trying to straighten it? Uh, Heaven bless you, but I'm afraid you're undertaking too heavy a task. What was he doing there in the first place? If he were innocent, why didn't he say so? Precisely. And if he were guilty, why didn't he invent a lie? His silence appears to cut both ways. But uh, pray continue. You've told me you were shouting. Now, what about the rest of the household? Oh, the whole house was astir. Mary was the first to rush into my room. At the sight of the coronet and Arthur's face, she screamed and fainted dead away. Mm. And when did the police enter the case? An inspector and a constable were there within an hour. And here again, Arthur's behavior pointed only to his guilt. If you'll allow me to recount the scene to you. Father, I'm asking whether it's your intention to charge me with theft. This is no longer a private matter. That coronet is national property. The law must take its course. You might at least do me one favor. And that is? Don't have me arrested at once. I implore you to let me leave the house for just five minutes. Believe me, it would be to your advantage as well as mine. So that you can run away? I give you my word I shall return if you let me leave. I'm afraid your word is something that holds no value in this situation. If you don't intend to run away, perhaps you wish to leave in order to conceal the stones you've stolen? When you take that attitude, I see it's useless for me to try to help you. Help me? Why don't you help yourself? There were 39 perfectly matched barrels in that coronet. Three are missing. You can still avert a national scandal. I beg you to tell me where the missing stones are, and I promise you that all will be forgiven and been forgotten. Keep your forgiveness for those who ask for it. When I heard those words, Mr. Holmes, I realized that anything further was useless. I called the inspector and gave Arthur into custody. Mm -hmm. Did the police make any attempt to locate the missing gems? Oh, they're still sounding the planking and probing the furniture in hope of finding them. How about outside the house? Uh, They've shown extraordinary energy. The whole garden has already been minutely examined. (laughs) Mr. Holmes, my head is spinning. What do you make of it? Well, let's first look at what you make of it, Mr. Holder. It's your opinion that your son came down from his bedroom, went at great risk to your dressing room, opened your bureau, took out the coronet, broke a small portion of it off by main force, went off to some other place, concealed three gems out of some 39 with such skill that nobody can find them, then returned with the other 36 into the room in which he exposed himself to the greatest danger of discovery. Now, I ask you, sir, is such a theory tenable? Uh, Certainly not the way you put it. But I ask you, what other is there? If his motives were innocent, why doesn't he explain them? It's my task to find out. Holmes, myself, and a thoroughly confused but slightly more hopeful Alexander Holder set off for Fairbank, a modest residence of the great financier. Holmes left us standing at the door and walked slowly around the house. He was so long that Mr. Holder and I went into the dining room and waited by the fire for his return. Now, as we sat there, a slim, dark, pale-faced woman entered the room. You've given orders that Arthur should be freed, haven't you, Dad? No, my dearest. The matter must be probed to the very bottom. But I'm sure he's innocent. Perhaps he refuses to talk because he's angry that you should suspect him. Would any sane man have acted otherwise? I I saw what I saw. Trust a woman's instinct, Dad. Take my word for it that he's innocent. Let the matter drop and say no more. Uh, Far from letting the matter drop... I've brought a gentleman down from London to inquire more deeply into it. This gentleman? No, his friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's round in the stable lane now. The stable lane? 
What on earth can he hope to find there? Oh, this, I suppose, is he. I sincerely trust, sir, you will succeed in proving that my cousin Arthur is innocent of this crime. I hope I may prove it. I believe I have the honor of addressing Miss Mary Holder. May I ask you a question or two? Anything. Anything that will help clear up this horrible affair. Last night, you heard nothing yourself? Not until I was wakened by my uncle's voice and the shouting coming from his room. Mm -hmm. Your uncle has told me that you usually lock up at night. That's so. Did you fasten all the windows last night? Yes. And were they all fastened this morning? Yes. Now, you have a maid who has a sweetheart. I think that you remarked to your uncle last night that she had been out to see the sweetheart? Yes. She's also the girl who waited in the drawing room. And she may have heard Uncle's words about the coronet. Mm-hmm, I see. You infer, then, that she may have gone out to tell her sweetheart and that the two of them may have planned the robbery. Well, what's the use of all this? I saw Arthur with the coronet in his hands. These theories... Please, please, Mr. Holder, I must ask you to allow me to pursue the investigation in my own fashion. Holmes wanted to see the dressing room and the coronet, and we, we all trooped upstairs. On the way, Holmes continued to question Mary Holder. Now, about the servant girl, Miss Holder. Last night, you saw her return to the house by the kitchen door, I presume. It was when I went to see that the door was fastened for the night. I met her slipping in. Mm -hmm. I saw the man, too, in the half-light. Do you know him? Oh, yes. He's the green grocer who delivers our vegetables. His name is Francis Proper. He stood to the left of the door, did he not? Why, yes, he did. Then he's a man with a wooden leg. Why, you're like a magician. How did you know that? Since we've reached what's obviously your dressing room, Mr. Holder, I'd like now to have a look at the coronet. Well, if you'll wait just a moment till I get the case from the bureau. Uh, there it is. Mm. Now, here... Here's the coronet. Thank you. I see this corner here corresponds to that which was so unfortunately lost. Might I ask you to break it off? You might not. I shouldn't dream of trying. Then if you'll allow me... I will. No. No, no chance. I feel it give a little. But although I have exceptional strength in my fingers, I cannot do it. Now, Mr. Holder... What do you think would happen if someone should succeed in breaking this off? I have no idea. There would be a noise like a pistol shot. And if you tell me that all this happened within a few yards of your bed and you heard nothing, then I say I do not believe it. Well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, has my father succeeded in convincing you of my guilt? Are you here to get my confession? Quite the contrary, young man. I know that you are innocent. All I ask is that you confirm some deductions that I've made as to what happened in the house the night that the coronet was mutilated and the jewels stolen. Well, I should think it's your task to find the jewels. So it is, so it is. But you can make that task easier and at the same time clear yourself and ease your father's anguish. He's brought it on himself. Mm. Is your father also to blame for your gambling debts? Of course not, I've been a fool, but I'm through with all that. Once I pay this lost debt, I'll never touch a card again. And what about the club? I'll resign. Ah. And I won't miss it. I'll be glad never to walk through those doors again. And how about the friends you've made there? Sir George Burnwell, for instance. Won't you miss his company? I rather think it will be the other way around. Indeed. From what your father told me, I thought Sir George was your mentor and your ideal. Oh, you think you're very clever. Perhaps you are, but you'll get nothing from me. No more answers, nothing. If I am tried and convicted, so be it. And that is my last word. Well, I, I can't understand why you're looking so content, considering how little progress we made with that young man. My dear Watson, if you think back on the conversation, I'm sure you'll see we made... Gigantic strides. Huh? For one thing, he told us that he's equally angry with his father and Sir George Burnwell. Well, so he did, but well, how, how that helps is beyond me. Look at the facts. Up until the incident of the coronet, Sir George Burnwell, according to his father, was Arthur's constant companion and dazzling friend. Well, and he was also in good terms with his father. Precisely. 
Now it stands to reason he has cause to turn against the father who accuses him of theft. But why does he also change his feelings about Sir George? <laughs> I've no idea. Uh, and I don't see how it has anything to do with the matter we're looking into. Only this, Watson, that the sudden breaking off of this friendship comes at exactly the time of the theft of the coronet. Well, couldn't it be coincidence? Mm, exactly what I'm going to find out. This note is to a friend of mine who's a member of the same club, and I'm asking for an invitation. Huh. Well, what do you intend to do when you get there? Why, gamble. Of course. Ah, Watson, you shouldn't have waited up for me. <laughs> I might have been out all night. As a matter of fact, I should have been, but I felt that losing 150 pounds was more than enough. You lost 150 pounds? Mm -hmm. Naturally. I was cheated. Cheated? Mm -hmm. Who? By whom? Sir George Burnwell. Oh, but, but surely you unmasked the scoundrel. No, I did nothing of the sort. I paid my losses and walked away. Burnwell is a devilishly charming man. Well, I, I, I don't care how charming he may be. He's a cheat, and he should be blackballed. No doubt. Now, here. Look at this deck of cards. Huh? Mm -hmm. Observe how I'm holding it. In gambling circles, this is known as the mechanic's grip. Oh, sir. And should you ever sit down in a game with a man who holds the deck in this fashion, I urge you, Watson, to get up and walk away. Huh. Uh, and Sir George held the deck this way? Most certainly. And it enabled him to deal what gamblers call seconds. Oh. Well, it's too much for me. Let me illustrate. Well. Huh? Now, observe, Watson. I turn the top card face over. Huh? What is it? Well, it's the ace of clubs. Exactly. And now watch as I deal you four cards and deal myself four cards. Now, since the ace of clubs was on top, it should be the first card I dealt to you. Isn't that so? Oh, yes, yes mm -hmm. certainly. All right. Turn your cards face up and show me the ace. What? What isn't here? Where is it, Holmes? Exactly where it was before I dealt, Watson. On the top. Oh, sir. I dealt you always the second card, just as Burnwell did when he dealt thus reserving the ace for him when he needed it. Well, it's amazing, Holmes. But uh, I don't see how that explains the theft of the coronet. It supports the only logical deduction as to how the crime was committed and who stole the gems. You, you mean that the whole thing was, was some sleight of hand trick? I mean only that after a brief return to Fairbank, I will be able to tell Inspector Lestrade who the criminal is and where to look for the gems. Magic and sleight of hand are practiced by many. And some of the magicians of the world have performed tricks which border on the incredible. But so far, no one had been able to duplicate the feats of detection registered by the unique Sherlock Holmes. We'll be back shortly with the solution of the affair of the barrel coronet. It's ironic that the incomparable solver of mysteries, Sherlock Holmes, should himself be the source of a puzzle whose answer has eluded all the experts. The puzzle is, what accounts for his undiminished popularity? The hold that he has exerted over four generations of readers. My personal belief is that the Holmes stories satisfy a deep-seated longing for a well-ordered existence where justice always triumphs. That may be an oversimplification, but let us put that speculation aside and visit with him and Dr. Watson as they bring yet another case to a triumphant conclusion. Holmes returned early in the afternoon uh, with that glint in his eyes which told me things had gone well. Watson, they're doing the Symphony Fantastique at Covent Garden tomorrow evening. And by that time, we'll have completed the investigation of this little affair of the barrel coronet. Ah, you know the culprit. Oh, I knew that yesterday. But there's an interesting development. Here, read this note from Mary Holder to her uncle. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, my dearest uncle, I feel that I've brought trouble upon you and that if I'd acted differently, this terrible misfortune might never have occurred. I cannot, with this thought in mind... Never again be happy under your roof. And I feel I, 
I must leave you forever. Oh, dear. Do not worry about my future, for that is provided for. In life or in death, I am ever your loving Mary. Holmes, do you think this is a suicide note? No, 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 no. Nothing of the kind. It is perhaps the best possible solution. Well, what can this note possibly mean? Now bring it along with us while we visit with young Arthur Holder and everything will become perfectly clear. Before you start with any questions, I want you to know I haven't changed my mind. No questions, I promise. We bring you some news. Your cousin Mary has left the house. Oh, I don't believe you. It's a trick. Show him the note, Doctor. See, my dearest uncle, I feel it must leave you. Oh, the fool. The poor little fool. You cannot blame her too much. You were also taken in by the rogue, were you not? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Sir George Burnwell. I believe she's with him now. You're wrong. You must be wrong. Mary couldn't... Why not? She's led an extremely sheltered existence. And you have personal knowledge of what a charming, plausible villain the man is. When Sir George undoubtedly told her of his undying love, she believed him and became his, his willing tool. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. You, above all, should know it's true. How else do you explain her action on the night your father accused you of taking the coronet? You don't know anything about that on night. On the contrary, I know everything. And I shall prove it to you. You went to bed, but you slept badly after the argument with your father. Well, what has that got to do with Mary? Because you had difficulty sleeping, you were curious when you heard a soft step pass your door. You looked out and were astonished to see your cousin walking stealthily along the passage leading to your father's room. Mary doesn't have it. She didn't... Didn't what? Keep it, you mean? Uh, I don't want to listen to any more. I am going to plead guilty and get it over with. Well, that won't help anyone, since I shall have your father engage a solicitor and pass on all the information I've gathered, and the whole world will then know about it. If you know so much, you don't need me. I would not be here if I didn't. Oh, very well. I'll, I'll listen to what else you have to say and then make my decision. Although I understand the depth of your feeling for your cousin, you shouldn't be blind to the fact that she acted ignobly. Mr. Holmes... If all you're going to do is criticize Mary... I am referring to her attempt to cast suspicion in your uncle's mind upon the maidservant. But it's perfectly true that Lucy saw her young man that night. I'm aware of that. But I also know that the maid had nothing to do with the coronet, as you yourself know. Because you saw Mary disappear into your father's dressing room. <gasps> you were so amazed by her actions that you slipped on a shirt and trousers and waited. When she came out of the room, you saw, to your horror that she carried the barrel coronet in her hands. You also saw her pass it through an open window to some person standing outside the house. Poor Mary. You make it sound almost as if you were there. For a moment, you were undecided. You wouldn't risk exposing Mary for anything in the world. But the instant she went back to her room, you ran out of the house and overtook Sir George Burnwell. I didn't know it was he until I caught up with him. Mm -hmm. And then you struggled with him. Each of you had a hold of the coronet, and then something suddenly snapped. You, finding the coronet in your hands, rushed back, closed the window, went to your father's room, and observing that the coronet was twisted, was trying to straighten it out when your father discovered you. Yes. Yes, you, you could see why I couldn't tell him. I see what difficulties love can lead a man into. But it was obvious that the reason for your cousin's fainting was that she saw you with the coronet and realized that you had the power to reveal her as the thief. Oh, she should have known I'd never do that. But how in the world did you know what happened outside the house? Now, simplicity itself. When I first arrived at Fairbank, I looked around the house for traces in the snow. When I reached the stable lane, there was a very long and complex story written there for all to see. I don't understand. There was a double line of tracks of a booted man and a second double line belonging to a man with naked feet. Though the man with the boots had walked both ways, I saw that a struggle had taken place near the road. When I examined the hall window with my lens, I could make out faint markings where a wet foot had been placed coming in. Your father had told me that you were dressed only in shirt and trousers. When I learned further that you wanted five minutes outside the house... It was obvious you hoped to find the missing jewels where the struggle had taken place. Hmm. Well, since you have it all down just the way it happened, why do you need me? Because of Sir George Burnwell. 
You know what an astute villain he is. He knows because of the nature of the theft, our hands will be tied in the matter of prosecution. Also, now he has an extra ally in May. Your father won't want to involve her and his home in that sort of scandal. Well, I still don't see how I can help. Simply tell me that you will testify against Sir George Burnwell in court if it should come to that. Mr. Holmes, I give you my word. Holmes sent me off after that interview with instructions to fetch Alexander Holder to Baker Street and wait there for his return. He was off to see Sir George Burnwell at the club. Ah, good morning, Mr. Holmes. Back for revenge, I fancy. I don't mind confessing that you deserve it. My good luck was outrageous. Uh, Shall we go to the card room? I think a small private room would be more suitable for the matter I wish to discuss. (laughs) There's a small room off the bar which would prove just the thing. Ah, here we are. Now, what exactly is it you wish, Mr. Holmes? The three gems you stole from the barrel coronet. I really don't believe I heard you correctly. Let's not waste each other's time. I know you for what you are. Gamesman, cheat, corrupter, and seducer of women. And now thief. So if you please, the gems. Dear chap, I suggest you see a physician. I can recommend an excellent man, by the way. He's in Harley Street, name of Langley. Now, I wish you good day. Before you open this door again... I've just come from the prison cell of Arthur Holder. I explained the evidence I have gathered to him, and he has agreed to testify against you in court. No, oh, I can't see this thing being brought up in court, old chap. You know, a national scandal. One of the realm's oldest and most honored families putting up national treasure for a loan. It would be distasteful, surely. But remember that Alexander Holder was willing to bring his son to court and let him stand trial when he believed the boy to be guilty. Do you think he'll show any mercy towards you? Ah. Yes, well, that does put things in a rather different... uh... I shouldn't if I were you. As you see, I came armed. No offense, old chap. I just thought I'd... uh... Add murder to your list. Not a chance. Never. Just mean to bash you over the head and get out of the country. (laughs) I am prepared to offer you a deal. Aha. Now, that's more the kind of talk I like to hear. And what did you have in mind? No prosecution. You can get clear of the country, just return the stones. Mm, I'm afraid I can't do that, old chap. I'm prepared to pay. How much? One thousand pounds apiece. Why, dash it all, I only got six hundred for the three. From whom? Look here, I think I can do my own bargaining. Do I have to restate my position? You will let me have the name of the man who has the stones, or... I think you're bluffing. I may just call it, but... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing with those cards? Going to demonstrate the art of dealing seconds, which I shall be glad to demonstrate to your foolish club members. Your fellow club members whom you've cheated over the years, unless you give me the man's name. Ah. Very well. Six hundred for the three... Just goes to show that a gentleman should never try to do a business deal. No. They should stick to cheating at cards. I brought Alexander Holder to our headquarters in Baker Street. And while we waited for Holmes, I told him as much as I could of the story clearing his son of the theft. When he was saddened to learn of his niece Mary's weakness but still most anxious about the recovery of the stones. Finally, Holmes arrived. He looked fatigued. Ah, thank you, Watson, for having Mr. Holder here. There you are, Mr. Holder. The missing stones still intact in their setting. Uh, I'm saved. Saved. How can I ever repay you, Mr. Holmes? With a check for £4,150. Uh, I, 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 I shall make it ten. No need, no need. I paid 3000 for the stones, 150 for expenses, and 1000 for a fee. But there is one other thing you owe, Mr. Holder. Name the sum, sir. Name it. The debt is not to me. You owe a very humble apology to your son, who acted most gallantly throughout the whole affair. <laughs> He shall have it as soon as I can deliver it in person. 
And what of poor Mary? Can your skill help me there? She, sir, is wherever Sir George Burnwell is. And that should be sufficient punishment for her sins, whatever they may be. And so our proper moralist, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, consigns Mary to her just punishment. He evidently wasn't a believer in the romantic notion of the world well lost for love. Romance wasn't Doyle's strong suit. Mystery, adventure, and deductive reasoning were his specialties. And they were enough to gain him a place among the immortals of literature. I'll be back shortly. several railroad stations in London. But one of the unanswered puzzles that has tormented aficionados of Sherlock Holmes tales is that Holmes always took a train from either Waterloo Station, Charing Cross, or Paddington. There's really no satisfactory explanation ever been offered why he never left from Euston, King's Cross, or Liverpool Street. All perfectly good stations but not for Sherlock Holmes. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, Russell Horton, and Catherine Byers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.